All right, there you go. You are our moderator and our first speaker. Go ahead and take it away, Adriana. Okay, it's a great pleasure to be here today. Um, let's see, sorry, I have something, I have something that's popped up and I can't get rid of it. Apologies for a second. Let me see if I can close it. Okay, perfect. All right. Uh, this is super exciting to be here today. Uh, my name is Adriana Briscoe and I'm going to not only speak um, but also I'm going to be the moderator for today. And this is a um, brand new talk, hot off the presses. I haven't practiced it, uh, I've scripted it. So I'll try to speak it um, in time, but um, there, I may run out of time for questions, but hopefully not. Okay, so super excited to talk about our recent work on the evolution of sexually dimorphic vision in color vision in heliconias. So this work, uh, is primarily a collaboration with my colleague JJ Emerson and um, our postdoc Mohul Chakraborty, as well as a post baccalaureate student in my lab, Angelica um, Lara. And uh, so I just need to give a brief introduction to the genetic players in color vision. So uh, we know that opsins are light sensitive proteins found in photoreceptor cells in a wide variety of organisms. In the familiar case of color vision, there are three opsins um, that are found in photoreceptors in the, in the retina, um, are cone cells, and they're sensitive to different wavelengths of light. These um, three opsins confer trichromatic color vision in humans. And when one of these opsins is missing, for example, the green or the red, um, then color vision, red green color vision is diminished. And in humans, this um, leads to color blindness. And because this, these two opsins are X-linked on the um, sex chromosome, this type of color vision is more common in males than in females. Uh, analogous um, color vision systems are found in other um, organisms. This is a system found in two related butterflies, Heliconia melpomene and Heliconia doris. So uh, um, melpomene is a little bit like humans in that you have three photopigments, except the short wavelength one is um, UV. You have a blue and a green. Heliconius doris, you have an ultraviolet, a violet, a blue, and a green. And so um, this particular configuration in Heliconius doris with the ultraviolet and the violet suggests that this species has um, UV color vision, whereas Heliconius melpomene does not. Interestingly, in other species of Heliconia, such as Heliconia cheritonia, you have a, you have a um, system similar to what I just showed you in Melpomene and Doris, but in this case, it's sexed linked. So in males, you have a UV, a blue, and a green opsin. In females, you have a, a violet, sorry, an ultraviolet, a violet, a blue, and a green opsin. Um, and so this particular sexual dimorphism is the topic of the presentation. Um, first, a little bit of a background. Um, in Heliconius, we know from work done in my lab that there's been a gene duplication of the UV opsin. Um, and so in these species shown in blue, there are two, there are two um, copies in all of these species, um, UV1 and UV2, um, but not in the outgroup taxa, Uedes Isabella. In, um, Heliconia smallpomony, for which there is a good reference genome, we know that UV1 is found on chromosome 17 and UV2 is found on chromosome 7. Uh, interestingly, um, previous work in my lab has shown that many species in this um, purple group have sexually dimorphic UV color vision, like I just showed you a minute ago for cheritonia. And um, so I just want to briefly review the evidence for that in the next couple slides. So immunohistochemistry work conducted by my graduate student, Kyle McCullough, um, with antibodies generated against the UV1, UV2, and blue opsin, uh, examined across these various heliconius lineages, shows that there is sexual dimorphism in the photoreceptor cells of heliconius eyes. So we're going to focus on the green opsin um, UV, which is UV1 in these images. Okay, so um, immune histochemistry of females only across these lineages showed that the presence of UV, of UV1 
in eyes across all of the species examined. So this is a group of five different species that Kyle looked at. Um, however, looking at the males of these five species, uh, two of which, um, Arado and um, Gilconia cera, found that UV1 expression was entirely missing in the eye, whereas in the remaining lineages, Malpomene, Sidno, Hakeli, Ismenius, and Doris, um, you find UV1 opsin expression in the eyes. We also looked at um, RNA-seq data for um, a wider sampling of butterflies, and the RNA-seq data match the immunohistochemistry data in that species for which we see UV1 protein expression in the eyes um, also show UV1 mRNA expression in eye and brain, whereas species that in which um, UV1 expression is sexually dimorphic, we do not see um, UVRH1 expression in male eyes um, on the basis of mRNA. So um, again, these green species have sexually monomorphic vision and the purple species have sexually dimorphic vision with respect to UV1 expression. So from these results, it seems likely that the common ancestors of the colored clades share the following state. So red is no dimorphism, blue is sexually dimorphic with respect to UVRH1 mRNA expression as, as well as their protein expression. And so the most parsimonious explanation for this variation is that this dimorphism evolved only once in Heliconius. Um, well, it's great to show that there's dimorphic expression in terms of mRNAs and proteins. Um, that gets at the phenotype at the level of the cell. It's also important to know whether this actually impacts their behavior. In the case of opsins, what's cool about them is that you can do behavioral experiments to go from a particular gene phenotype to um, behavior. And so my graduate student, Susan Finkbeiner, conducted a comparative study of UV color vision in Heliconius erato, Heliconius melpomene, and the outgroup UVs Isabella. This is work that has just been accepted for publication in the Journal of Experimental Biology. Um, a um, earlier draft of the paper is available on BioArchive, but she showed that UV, sorry, that Heliconius erato females have UV color vision, Heliconius erato males are UV colorblind, and um, both Heliconius melpomene males and females are UV colorblind. So, and this is presumably because they only expressed one UV opsin in, in their eyes. This is um, melpomene. So, um, <laughs> while these behavioral experiments are time consuming, um, and even though we've conducted them in a total of three species so far, the results are consistent with a model in which only the blue clade um, contains species with sexually dimorphic UV color vision, while the red clade um, contains species with sexually monomorphic um, vision and actually UV color blindness. Okay, so we are, the more recent work we've been doing is to try to understand the genetic mechanism of UV sexual dimorphism in Heliconius. And so I've been going around telling people because people I've given versions of this talk um, to various meetings, including I think in, thinking Beacon, and people have always asked me, is this gene sex linked? And I've always said no. And the reason for that is on the basis of the existing reference genome in H. Mulpomene, it is not sex linked at all. It's found on, on um, chromosome. 17. So we decided <laughs> for completely independent reasons, well, we just wanted to see if there was regulatory um, reasons that might differ between the species that might explain this to look at um, the reference genome or to construct a reference genome of Heliconius cheritonia. So we've embarked on this new genome. Um, and um, so what we did was we collected um, um, using high C data, 144 fold genome coverage. Uh, so, this is long read sequencing data using, so, sorry, not HiFi, using PacBio RS2 um, sequencing reads. 
We also collected a hundred fold Illumina short read sequencing for both males and females. And then we collaborated with um, Iskander Saeed and Russ Corbett Dedek at UC Santa Cruz to collect high C data. And so um, what you're seeing here is a plot that represents scaffold coordinates of the reference genomes. And the plot is a high C heat map of how frequently a segment of the genome on the X axis is near in the three dimensional space to a segment on the Y axis. And so um, what you can see is that each square represents a single scaffold, which is, which is really great. The fact that each scaffold comprises a uniform square of contact density with itself and not other scaffolds indicates a highly contiguous assembly with a um, few errors. And so we recovered a total of 20 chromosome pairs, including a Z and a W. Um, our contact in 50 is 116.5 um, megabase pairs, and our scaffold in 50 is 17.5 megabase pairs. So this is a very complete genome. Um, our BUSCO scores are on 99% um, with 97% single copy genes recovered. So when we compare our genome to that of Heliconius melpomene, we note it's entirely collinear with the melpomene genome. And moreover, we've recovered the W chromosome because we sequenced a female. Um, we also observe a fusion between um, chromosomes one and 11 um, in Heliconius melpomene cor corresponding to a single chromosome in Cheritonia. And so this genome represents so far the most contiguous assembly in the genus and ranks among the best among all butterflies. Uh, so now we have a high quality reference genome for Cheritonia. What's going on with UV1? So first the gene sequence marked in yellow is what we know from RNA sequencing data. And we, know, we now know that it's flanked by, by some transposable elements shown in purple and blue. Um, Angelica Laura, a, a postgraduate student in my lab, was annotating vision genes um, in the genome. And puzzlingly, she couldn't find UVRH1 in our initial first draft of the chromosome scaffolds. And so to, to um, solve this, Mahul searched the unscaffold the contigs and found that UVRH1 is on one of them. And so he manually reassembled the contig more stringently and discovered it was W-linked, which was totally unexpected. Um, we next examined the mapping of Illumina short reads to the genome, focusing on mapping density to the P of W and UV1 in particular. And so as expected, um, the female coverage is high, but there's essentially no male coverage in this region. So this is strong evidence that UV1 is W-linked in Cheritonia. Um, so I'm gonna go quickly over this. So what's interesting is that um, on a broad scale, the two chromosomes 17 in Melpomene and Cheritonia are roughly syntenic, but in the region where UV1 is found in um, Melpomene, it's totally missing in um, Cheritonia. And so we interpret this to mean that there must be a translocation between the homologous homologs of these chromosomes and the common ancestor of either the sexual dimorphic or monomorphic clades. So we have um, conducted independent PCRs of genomic DNA from independent individuals to check this hypothesis. And so Mahul developed PCR primers for UV1 and a control gene EF1 alpha. And this is a PCR from female Heliconius cheritonia versus male Heliconius cheritonia. And you can see that only the female amplifies UV1, the male does not, uh, whereas EF1 alpha amplifies both. And so this confirms what we know from our reference genome and our Illumina RNA-seq um, genomes. And so Mahul's expanded his PCRs across the phylogeny and um, what he's shown is that the species uh, that we, the, the purple species we showed earlier, and indeed uh, males and females, um, only, only females amplify UV1 um, from genomic DNA, whereas our control PCR amplifies across all samples. And then in Heliconius, um, which, which have sexually monomorphic opsin expression, both males and females um, amplify. So this is consistent with our expectations based on immuno expression and behavior. And so the balance of the evidence can be seen here. Um, um, unfortunately, we don't yet have data for Heliconius aoti, which is a critical um, species. Um, 
and I'll explain why, and then I'll end the talk. So, um, so far it suggests that there was a duplication along this particular lineage, and then we don't know what's going on after that. Okay, so um, we're very, this, this species is really important. If the species has it, um, both males and females have UV1, then this would suggest that the W chromosome translocation occurred along this branch. Um, if it is W-linked, then the autosomal translocation is probably secondary to an initial W-linked duplication. Um, I'm personally in favor of this hypothesis because we have RNA-seq data, which suggests that um, males do not express UV1 um, RNA, but we don't yet know yet because we haven't gotten the data for our genomic samples. Okay, so just to conclude, UV1 has sexually dimorphic opsin expression in Heliconius and not in others. In the species that are sexually dimorphic, UV1 is on the W chromosome. High quality whole genome reference data allowed us to identify the genetic basis of sexual dimorphism in a sensory system. And we're totally thrilled. And I will stop there since I've gone over. Thanks so much, everybody. Okay. Okay. So, <laughs> um, so I'm the moderator. And uh, there's like no time for, for um, any questions. So unfortunately, we'll just go ahead and have our next speaker, um, uh, Raiku, speak about the sinosure of CTBP, evolution of a bilateral transcriptional co-repressor. And I'll let you know when you have 12 minutes. Thanks. Thanks, Adriana. David Arnosti here, and I'm going to be presenting work from a senior graduate student in my laboratory, Ana Maria Raiku, and the team that she's been directing. And indeed, we're going to talk about the sinusure of CDBP. So first questions, I guess, would be, what is a sinusure? Well, it's literally Greek for dog's tail, and it's something that attracts a lot of attention. Originally, the name for Ursa Minor. And indeed, the molecule in a question here, we're going to be looking at its tail. So I've been debating with my students about whether this is a good paper title or not, but fun for talks. So let's see. I seem to have, wait a minute. Let me reshare that in just a second. So CDBP is a molecule, it's a protein, it's found in bilaterians, so higher animals, it's an abbreviation for C-terminal binding protein, and this protein is involved in gene transcription. As I'll describe, it's a co-repressor, we've been working on this in the lab for some time, and the protein has the ability to bind to NAD or NADH. And it also has the ability to bind to a variety of other substrates. So what's so interesting about this protein? CDBP was originally identified through a cancer connection by the Chinaduri lab at St. Louis University. They were interested in cancer and adenovirus regulated processes. And they found a cellular protein, which they dubbed C-terminal binding protein because it bound to the C-terminus of a viral oncoprotein E1A. This was back in 95. Just a few years later then, uh, research showed that what CDBP was doing at a cellular level was interacting with cellular transcription factors, shown here as a green circle, and recruiting chromatin-modifying agents such as histone deacetylases and others. And CDBP binds to thousands of loci in, for example, the human genome and regulates many genes including those related to uh, cancer processes such as metastasis. However, CDBP also has roles in development, not just in disease, and work from Levine's lab uh, just a few years after the human uh, version of this gene was found showed that a fruit fly version of CDBP interacts with a developmental transcription factor, CNRPS and SNAIL, and they used molecular genetic methods to show that this was inducing transcriptional repression. So as shown in this paper from Nardini 
uh, CDBP has very distant cousins in the alpha hydroxy acid dehydrogenase family. So there are homologous genes found in bacteria and in eukaryotes, which carry out other kinds of cellular processes, specifically dehydrogenase reactions. And when lining up the peptide sequences of these proteins, it's clear that the core region that I showed you in that picture has a lot of similarity, both at the structural level, which are the alpha helices, beta sheets, and also at the amino acid level. So one can find distant cousins of this core region, but there's also a C-terminal extension on the CTPP proteins, which is predicted to be unstructured and not at all similar to these other more distantly related dehydrogenases. So more recently, uh, work from William Royer's lab has shown that CDBP, upon binding to NAD, forms dimers and then can form tetramers. And as Ana Maria Raiku showed in a recent perspective piece, the structure of this tetramer has been well resolved by X-ray crystallography and cryo-EM. However, there's a large chunk of protein which we know nothing about structurally, just shown schematically here, this C-terminus or the sinusure. This uh, varies in length, and uh, we have absolutely no structural information about that. So uh, using comparative genomic analysis, Ana Maria and her team of postbacs and undergrads carried out very extensive analyses of what kind of CDBP coding regions are found. And we couldn't have done this uh, work just a few years ago, but the extensive uh, expansion of genomic sequencing and cDNA availability for many rather odd critters uh, allowed us to take a pretty comprehensive view. And a, a take home lesson here is that in invertebrates, it appears that diversity of CDBP C termini is generated through multiple different splicing isoforms, whereas there's another layer of complexity in gene duplication, which is found only in craniata, so vertebrates essentially. Uh, CDB, true CDBP homologs, we think, are limited to bilateria. Looking at other animals, such as cnidarians or sponges, we can only find very distant alpha hydroxy acid like enzymes. So it seems that with the evolution of the bilaterian body plan, somewhere in the Precambrian, CDBP gene was recruited from an earlier uh, metabolic process activity to a nuclear co-repressor scaffold. Now, not only is there variability in splice forms, uh, we've done earlier protein work to prove that, for instance, in insects, there are actually proteins that are expressed that conform to these different isoforms. And these are developmentally and in a tissue specific fashion expressed, although the actual function, the differential function of these isn't known. Now looking more closely here, for instance, in hexapods, including many different insect orders, Ana Maria and her helpers then looked very carefully at the different isoforms that were predicted to be expressed. And here I'm showing you just the portion of the protein which encodes the C-terminus, the unstructured, less conserved portion. Uh, the rest of it would be almost solid blue across these different insect orders. So here we're looking at the very C-terminal portion and it's quite clear that there are many blocks of sequence which are highly conserved across some 400 million years of insect evolution. And then in many, many different species, we see insertions of unstructured, often uh, poly homopolymeric repeats that divide these. And this is something that can be found even within uh, relatively recently derived or, or uh, evolved species in Drosophila, for instance, but also over longer evolutionary times. And from considering these different protein sequences, it's clear that there are some rules and some exceptions. One of those, for instance, is that considering the very C-terminus of the C-terminus, we find absolutely conserved sequences, which are actually not absolutely conserved. For instance, if we look in hymenopteran wasps 
ants, bees, and so forth, it appears that they all have a different derived very C-terminal region, which has been locked in. And exactly, again, what the function is or why this works well for a hymenopteran, maybe this is the secret of social insect behavior, or maybe it's a tiny portion of that. So we've also uh, observed that the C-terminal sequences are conserved, conserved in protostomes and deuterostomes. So it's clear that there are structural aspects, primary structural aspects that are the same in humans and insects, but certain lineages have decided to wholesale swap out the C-termini. These include platyhelminthes, so flatworms and roundworms, C. elegans and their as well as more recently in very um, uh, smaller recently tips of branches such as varroa mites. And essentially what has happened is you have a completely conserved enzyme core with uh, not at all uh, homologous sequences, which however are within the clades pretty well conserved. So anything from, we don't understand why certain lineages then have decided to swap out there's no example that we found where these bilaterians throw away the C-terminus. So having a flexible and structured tail seems to be an important portion of how this thing works. So how do we actually ask functional questions? Ana Maria set up molecular genetic experiments where she actually is able to test different isoforms of CWP, bringing them onto genes using a endonuclease dead Cas9 to repress them. And she finds in some examples that CDBP short doesn't work the same as long. These are just different uh, functional readouts in Drosophila. So this is an important question that we are trying to tackle. Why look at evolution of this core machinery? So I'd just like to take one minute to focus on this important question. We know from considering the core transcriptional machinery across life forms that it's really conserved. RNA polymerase, for instance, in bacteria, in archaea, and in eukaryotes has incredibly similar uh, functional properties. So there's deep, deep conservation for the core machinery. And a typical EVO-DEVO kind of study focuses on transcription factors, Hox genes, for instance, which are well understood to have uh, undergone extensive diversification and contributing to the wonderful diversity of body plans in bilaterians. So transcription factors and cis elements are indeed important parts of evolutionary processes that drive innovation. However, there is abundant evidence that the core transcription machinery, such as CWP, or the TF2D complexes that bind to promoters also have undergone a lot of diversification and lineage specific derivations. And we don't understand the significance. The reasons I think are mostly technical because these evolutionary changes are highly pleiotropic and it's much more difficult to do the kind of experiments or tease out the functional properties of a reconfigured transcriptional core machinery compared to a transcription factor that programs eyes. So we need to develop approaches and techniques that we can really understand the second half of evolutionary processes in the core transcriptional machinery, in addition to sequence specific transcription factors that are expressed in particular tissues and so forth. I'd like to thank all the people in my lab, NIH for support, Ana Maria in particular for driving this. I'd be happy to take any questions and thanks for your time. Great, we should have at least three minutes or something like that available Very good. for questions. <laughs> Uh, since there's no questions on this talk, can I ask you a question, Adriana? Sure. Go for <laughs> it. Sorry. So, so the, the, the sexual dimorphism stuff was really cool, as, as everybody discussed. 
But I'm asking um, about whether there was any selection favoring it in the lineage in, lineage in which it evolved. And if so, what might have been the selection pressures for that? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're continuing to try to figure that out. Um, it seems like, <clears throat> it seems like, and the, and the evidence is, is based on, on um, a combination of modeling and some behavior. Um, so it's, you know, it's porous, but it looks like there's both sexual selection and sex specific selection that may have favored um, the configuration of opsins in males um, that lack the UV1 and then on the females that have both UV1 and UV2. You, um, females we know can use it for um, the context of feeding. And um, we've shown that some of their specialized pollen flowers have um, their enhanced UV vision would be benefited, benefit the females for finding those pollen flowers. So that's the short answer. Uh, we're still working on it, but um, we think there's been selection in both directions on the males for um, color vision that would I would help them distinguish mimics from un, from from mimics that are unrelated um, but look slightly different. And then for the females for this issue of foraging, which helps them uh, provision their eggs. So. Okay, we, we should probably move on to our next speaker, um, which is Chris Waters, um, speaking on discovery of a novel phage defense system in Vibrio cholera. All right, thanks, Adriana. Hi, everybody. You'll hear me okay? Uh, it's good to see you all. Thanks for the opportunity to present this uh, beacon funded work. It's been a really fun project by a lot of different people. Uh, listed down here and I'll list along the way. And this really is going to talk about a couple of phage defense systems that we've discovered in Vibrio cholera. And so uh, this work was led in my lab by uh, two graduate students, uh, Jeff Severin, who graduated back in the middle of the pandemic in 2020 and is now a postdoc at University of Michigan and Brian Shu. Um, led the work in my lab. So my lab is interested in the bacterium Vibrio cholera. It's the causative agent of cholera, which causes tens of thousands of deaths worldwide. I'm not going to go into a lot of the details, but one of the things that we think is interesting about cholera is it has to survive in lots of different environments, including causing disease in the host and living outside in the environment. And so it persists for a long time outside in the environment in between infecting the host. And of course, there's lots of ecological factors that act on cholera and um, are select for its evolution. And one of them is phage. This is a major uh, driving force for the evolution of Vibrio cholera. Cholera will bloom after outbreaks and then phage uh, um, increase in frequency and then decrease the amount of cholera. So this is one of the major things that Vibrio cholera has to cope with is phage predation. So important to this talk is I need to tell you a little bit about the evolution of the real cholera pandemics. There are seven known the real cholera pandemics. The first six were presumably caused by one biotype called the classical biotype, and that ended in, in the 20s. And then the current seventh pandemic, which started way back in 1961, is caused by the l Tor biotype. And so that one's persisted for a really long time. And what's cool about this is it's kind of like uh, Rich, Rich Linsky's um, experiment on a global scale. So really classical has disappeared. You don't see it anymore. It doesn't cause infections. It's hard to find. And LTOR emerged. And so LTOR took over on a worldwide scale. But why is that? Nobody really understands that. But we do know a little bit about the genetic changes between classical and LTOR. So you can kind of think of classical as a hot dog. This is your basic hot dog. An l -tor is really a hot dog with ketchup and mustard. So it's the acquisition of two genomic islands um, of about 36 genes. This is the major genomic difference between classical and l -tor. And as I said, there's not really much known about these genomic islands. So when we started this project, only one of the 36 um, islands or genes have been appreciated. 
And um, what I'm going to tell you today is what we really think is one of these islands, VSP1, is contributing to the fitness of cholera by providing phage defense. So the only gene that was known when we started this project a number of year, years ago was this uh, gene DNCV. And that's actually a, a cyclic dinucleotide synthase. It makes the cyclic dinucleotide uh, cyclic GMP, AMP, or CGAN. And my lab's interested in studying cyclic dinucleotides. So we asked the question, well, what is CGAMP doing in the cell? And I'm just going to summarize this whole project in one slide. I'm going to go into the details of this. This is a great collaboration with a friend of mine, Waylon Ng, and his grad student, Marion Ramlinden, and Jeff from my lab. But essentially, what we found was that the CGAMP that's made by DNCV activates this phospholipase, which we named Cap B, and that's encoded right next to DNCV. So that's on that island. And when CGAMP activates a phospholipase, what that enzyme does is it degrades phospholipids. So it starts chewing up the membrane of the cell. So why would cholera want to do this? Um, well, Rotom Sorbs group published um, soon after we published that paper that this was actually an anti-phage system. So he called it a CBAS system for cyclic oligonucleotide-based anti-phage signaling system. And so what happens is when lytic phage infect the cell, is, as we all know, they have to propagate. And so they have to use a lot of nucleotides to make genomes, which will be important later. And they make a lot of phage. And then the cell lyses and those phage go and infect other cells in the population. And so this system is really an altruistic suicide system. Um, when the phage infects, it activates synthesis of this CGAMP and that binds to the phospholipase and it kills the infected cell. So the cell kills itself to save its neighbors. All right, so really it's a kill switch. Uh, so it's a really cool system. And we're still studying a lot of questions about this system as well. Um, so we can kind of expand a little bit of what we know about uh, these islands. So at least for VSP1, we can now add uh, cat B to this list. But we wondered what if some of these other genes do? And this is where we wrote a beacon proposal with Eva Top um, to do some bioinformatics and look at what some, some of these other genes might be doing. And so this is really work that's led by her grad student, Clint Elge. And he developed this bioinformatics program called Corology. And it's a simple concept. The idea is that if you look for co-occurrence of genes in bacterial genomes, and if they co-occur more frequently than you would expect based on chance, they might have a shared biological function, or they might be part of some gene network of common function. So Clint developed this program, and actually you can use it. Uh, so it's, he's going to make it available for everybody. So if you're interested in taking this kind of approach, you can talk to him. Um, but you can see the CBAS system here on VSP1. Uh, his program discovered it. So this was nice validation. We saw this connection, and we knew there was a biological connection. Um, you can see there's some other networks too, which will be interesting to study, but this one gene really popped out, BC0175. So this was on the island and connected to the CBAS system, but we really had no idea like what it was doing. So we decided to follow up on this one. So here's to give you a little bit of perspective. Here's BC0175, and we named this gene DCDV. Okay, and DCDV that name came from um, its predicted function as a deoxycytidyl deaminase. So this is, um, so this is deoxycytidyl deaminase vibrio. So this is an enzyme that takes cytidine bases and it basically removes this amino group. And when that happens to a cytidine, it becomes a uracil. Okay, so this is an enzyme to convert cytidine to uracils. And we thought this was pretty interesting because it, in eukaryotic systems, these enzymes are known to be involved in viral defense. Um, and the classic one is apobec proteins. So apobec proteins in humans, for example, um, they actually target retroviruses like HIV, and they uh, convert cytosines to uracils in the DNA of these viruses, and that causes these viruses to have a lot of uh, mutagenesis, the genomes become um, unstable, so it's one of the primary defense mechanisms against HIV. But these enzymes have never been described to be involved in phage defense. So we thought that was cool that this might potentially be a phage defense mechanism. Okay. So some work from Chris Rhodes, who was a Beacon funded undergrad in my lab for uh, several years, and he just got into med school. So way to go, Chris. He, he made these strains of Vibrio cholera where he uh, deleted these two genomic islands. So they were uh, deleted from the genome. 
and we overexpress DCDD, so the cytidine neonidase. Now, in the wild type, there's no real effect, so it doesn't affect growth at all if we measure growth. But interestingly, in the island deletion mutants, we saw this growth inhibition at later ODs, but only when the islands were gone. And this actually comes from the cells starting to filament. So at higher ODs, when you express DCDV, you get these filamentous cells. Um, the reason why it's a spiral is because cholera is a curved cell. So it's just a natural curvature of cholera. Um, so it looked like the DCDV is active in the absence of the islands, but it's inhibited in wild type cells. Um, now I know that uh, regulation and gene regulation is not really um, well, most people in Beacon are interested in it, so I'm not going to go into all the details, but essentially what we found was that um, there was an RNA regulator upstream of DCDV, which we call DIFV for DCDV and sensitivity factor Vibrio. And this is an untranslated RNA that we have a lot of evidence actually binds to the enzyme. And so um, you can think of the enzyme as a toxin and this RNA as an antitoxin. So it's really a toxin antitoxin system. Um, and in the absence of diff B, we can see filamentous cells and we can complement that back. So there's this post transcriptional, post translational regulation of DCDV by diff B. Okay. Um, and, and we discovered this in Vibrio on this island and we wondered how widespread this was. So we started up a really fun collaboration with Janani Ravi to use bioinformatics and scan for homologs of DCDV across all known genomes. And we found that this enzyme was actually widespread uh, across the whole tree of life. So we find it in bacteria. We also find some examples in archaea, although there aren't a lot. And we do find some examples in eukaryotes as well. So this DCDV enzyme is widespread, but its function has never really been described. Um, we can also functionally look at the activity of some of these homologs. So if we overexpress uh, these different DCDVs from these uh, for bacterium here, cholera, Vibrio parahemolyticus, Proteus mirabilis, and enterotoxigenic E. coli. You can see it causes E. coli to filament when that, those enzymes are overexpressed. And what's really cool is we can take the corresponding diff Bs, so these RNAs, and we can inhibit the activity of the um, cognate enzyme. And you can see there's cross inhibition within Vibrios. So we know that these systems are widespread and they share common functions. Now, what is it doing in the cell? Uh, we you know, did a lot of different work and we eventually figured out that it, it's targeting nucleotides in the cell. So it's not targeting um, DNA um, itself, but it's actually targeting the nucleotides. So here's one example. If we overexpress DCDV in an E. coli cell, we can deplete DCTP pools, um, DCMP pools, um, and we also deplete DUTP pools. So we can do that for the cholera, DCDV or the E. coli DCDV, and we can make mutations in the active site and lose that activity. So this enzyme is depleting uh, nucleotide pools within the cell. And so how, what does this have to do with phage? Well, you know, like I said, this is a, like a toxin antitoxin system. And there's one system that's known, a type three toxin antitoxin system that's similar. Um, and in this case, when both of these are expressed, DCDV and DIFB, we think the system shut off. So this RNA from DIFB is inhibiting the activity of DCDV. But in toxin antitoxin systems, if you shut off expression, the antitoxin is much less stable and the toxin then becomes active. So we, we, we thought if we inhibited expression of DIFB and DCDV, DCDV would then become active. And sure enough, that's what we saw. So we did this by using rifampicin, which inhibits transcription, um, to test this model. And then spectinomycin, which inhibits translation, we predicted would not turn the system on. You have three Wait, minutes, Chris. OK, I'm almost done. Okay. Um, and so sure enough, that's what we saw. So when we added rifampicin in Vibrio cholera, we deplete DCTP and we deplete DCMP. And we see an increase of DUMP. Um, spectinomycin has no effect, and if we get rid of DCDV, it has no effect as well. So um, this is DCDV dependent. My last data slide here, does this have anything to do with phage defense? Um, sure enough, it does. So if we take DCDV and DIFV under their native promoters, any e. coli, um, so we're not inducing these, these have to be induced by the phage, 
and we uh, probe against 10 different E. coli phage, you can see we see significant protection against three of those phage up to 100 fold protection. So there's protection against some phage, but not others for reasons we don't understand. So to summarize this new system that we discovered in cholera, we think it's uh, inhibited. So this uh, deaminase is inhibited by an RNA. And when phage infect, somehow this RNA gets shut off either by inhibition of transcription um, or degradation. And then the system turns on and depletes the nucleotides and that inhibits phage replication. So that's our current model. Um, and we have this published on BioArchive if you want to check it out. And Rotom Sorbs group also just discovered this about the same time as well. Um, so I think I thanked everyone along the way. I want to thank Beacon for really getting this project started, uh, which is you know, now expanded to a five-year NIH grant. So it's really been fantastic. So I'll stop there. Okay, we've got about a minute and a half. Paul Turner, do you want to go first? Sure. Can you hear me? Yeah. I hope so. Okay, this, this is really interesting. Of course, the obvious question is why the difference among those phages? Why do you think yeah, we got that? Yeah, we're not sure. Thing? That's uh, going to be paper number two that <laughs> Brian's looking at. Uh, he has looked at, we thought it might be that some phage actually inhibit DIFV expression, whereas others don't. But that doesn't seem to be just the case. Like, for example, T7, we don't see a lot of protection, but we still see DIFV go away on a northern blot. So okay. um, we're not entirely sure. Some might just be more sensitive to the nucleotide depletion. You could also come up with a scenario where there might be some phage that actually express their own diphthys, right? Mm -hmm. And inhibit DCDD, which would be super cool. Yeah, great thoughts. That, that was a cool talk. Thank you, Chris. Thanks. We have time for one more question, 30 seconds. So Anya asked one in the chat. Oh, okay, I don't have my chat open yet. Do you want me to just read it? Uh, I see it. Uh, temperate phage. Yeah, I don't know, Anya, maybe. Uh, I, I doubt as much, though, because I think it's more the lytic phage or the ones that inhibit transcription, which I think is the big signal that's turning the system on. So a lot of phage, right? One of the first things they do is hit, inhibit host cell transcription to induce the system. So a temperate phage coming out, maybe, maybe. I don't know. I have to think more about that. Good question. Thanks so much, Chris. We should probably move on to our next speaker. Everybody. Uh, yeah, and check out the questions in the chat. So our next speaker is Alexander um, Brico, a protein optimizing evolving tool poet based on genetic programming. Okay, can everyone hear me just fine? Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, perfect. So yeah, as I just said, I'm Alex Bricka. I'm doing my presentation on a protein optimization evolving tool based on genetic programming. Okay, so this project begins in MRI or magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, the mechanism of the imaging is we use these strong magnetic fields and from them we're able to make hydrogen atoms in a sample produce radio waves. We're able to reconstruct images out of this and we can use it on anything that has a disabundance of hydrogen atoms. So water is present in everything and so we get good images from oranges like in the picture and we get good images from inside people which is what we use for diagnosing disease. MRI is pretty widely used, but 38 million scans in the US per year. Now, in my lab, we primarily work with this mechanism called chemical exchange saturation transfer, or CEST, and it's a contrast mechanism. So we can use it to tell an area with the contrast agent, distinctly apart from an area without the contrast agent, even from a very small amount of it. So with MRI, we can make it so that only certain hydrogen atoms produce signal. So typically what we'll do is we'll send out a pulse and then all the hydrogen atoms in say water will produce a signal. And we typically target water because there's a lot of water in biology and that creates a powerful signal. So we also have the ability to tag these hydrogen atoms to make it so they'll produce no signal. So we can tag, let's say this nitrogen's hydrogens. Uh, then 
since it's in a solution, the hydrogen atoms are constantly being swapped back and forth between the solvent and the solute. This allows the tagged hydrogens to move to the water and thus result in a decrease in signal. In an experiment, what happens is I take the same sample and I apply it to a large series of pre-saturation pulses, taking an image for each one. And that looks like the black line. Then I'm able to look at this compared to if it was symmetrical across the, uh, the frequency axis with the center frequency being the point where we would be tagging the hydrogen atoms of the water. Uh, from this difference, we're able to create the MTR, which is the magnetization transfer ratio. And doing this in the protein world, which is what we're doing, allows us to develop these reporter genes. It's very nice because compared to other reporter genes that we see in MRI, CEST uniquely does not need metal and you can not use a pre-saturation pulse so there's no tagging to get a clean image and then apply one so you can get a image of contrast. Currently, the most heavily used CEST reporter gene is the lysine-rich protein or LRP. It has gone on to be used numerous times in academia as a research tool for studying things as varied as oncolytic biotherapy or uh, cardiac gene therapy. Now I come from the biomedical engineering department and as an engineer, we need to say, this is really good, but can we actually get a better version? And this brought us to directed evolution. Uh, it's common in protein engineering. So we start with a base protein and then we apply a series of random mutations to it. We pick the best mutated version and then we just move one step forward and then we move and take that one as our new baseline, apply another series. And it climbs from point one to two, three, four, and five, like in the picture. However, it doesn't work the best in our individual circumstances. Uh, we can't screen a very large library of mutants at once. I can, in four or so hours, go through and evaluate the contrast of five peptides. Additionally, cess contrast is associated with amino acids that cause a relatively large amount of silent mutations. And a very small amount of exploration has actually been done in this field. And so we wanted to also look at a wider search space. And so we asked, can we use machine learning to help us develop a better cess, better cess contrast peptides than we could have with directed evolution? And this began a nice and beautiful collaboration with the Bonds Half Lab where we made POET, the protein optimization evolving tool. It uses genetic programming to predict and improve protein function. Instead of evolving the protein, we instead evolve models that predict the protein's uh, contrast from their formula. So first it creates this initial batch of models. The models are tested on how well they predict the training data the best models are able to transfer mechanisms and then parts of their model onto later generations while the worst ones do not. The models in POET are based off these tables of motifs, which is just a series of amino acids and weights, which is some number. And we just add them all together to determine how much contrast an individual peptide would have. We keep this going for a long time, and then we generate random peptides, a large number, a couple thousand, and we pick, we use the model to evaluate those, and you pick the best ones, and we move those to four, study. And that's resulted in this workflow where we have our initial data sets, either from literature or research of these small peptides. Uh, we're working at 12 amino acid level. And then we use POET to develop a model. We use the model to pick create top 10 peptides from our randomly generated list. We experimentally examine these peptides. And then the new data is fed back into POET. Learning begins anew. We generate new models, which is new peptides, new data, more training, so on and so forth. With this, we looked at two goals. First, we wanted to look at improving an existing function which would be contrast at 3.6 ppm and developing a new function, which would be contrast at 5 ppm.
Oh, there. Okay, so for improving an existing function. Lots of peptides generate contrast at 3.6 ppm. Many in nature do. And we also had a lot of prior literature to work with. So we kind of thought we understood how contrast at 3.6 ppm worked. It seemed like it would be a good test area for poet. Uh, so we took the literature, fed it in, and the first generation of using POET wasn't actually that good. Only one of the peptides was even soluble and it didn't generate that much contrast. However, it got better over time. At our peak, we generated some peptides that have four times more contrast than the LRP, which is what the everything is normalized to in the graph on the side. Although we haven't gotten a better peak peptide than the four times one, many of the peptides still produced are better than that prior state of the art of LRP. Uh, 5 ppm provided a new interesting question for us. Although we have observed it and prior literature has also observed it, prior literature has yet to explain what causes it. We had no idea what kind of proteins would produce contrast at that frequency. And so this seemed like a great idea of how to use POET to develop something new from somewhere where we don't have a good grasp from a human perspective. It's very useful because although since a lot of peptides generate 3.6 ppm contrast at 5 ppm, there's very little. And so functionally speaking, we get a better reporter chain from a smaller amount of increase at 5 ppm. Yeah. So when it came to developing this new function, I acquired all the Z spectra, a large number of frequencies from when we were doing the work at the 3.6 ppm. And since we had a full series of spectrums, I was able to take the 5 ppm data from them and use it as the training data. The first generation performed very well to the training data and later generations have not quite performed as well. Although they do show steadily increasing averages and steadily increasing peaks. And the most interesting point from all of this thus far has been what we have seen that we would not normally see. And the best way of demonstrating that is the data we have involving the isoelectric point, which is how positively or negatively charged it is, sorry, how many positive residues versus negative residues it has. Now, in prior literature, the contrast at 3.6 ppm was actually very much connected to the, how positively charged the peptide was. And we can see that from the training data, where it seems to form almost an exponential little curve, where the higher the charge, the more contrast it gets. But that is not what we found with our own data. Our best peptides have had less charge than the best peptide from the, yeah. they have had they're not our most charged peptides. Additionally, we have even have negative PIs that have resulted in more contrast than anything we had in our training data. So the quick conclusion is that POET has helped us generate better contrast agents, although it seems to stabilize out over a while, still doing experiments to figure out the exact reason for that, but I'm open to plenty of ideas. And the use of the Jacob program and this more evolutionary modeling has resulted in peptides that we never would have reached by rational design. I would like to thank our collaborators at the Bonsaf lab and our collaborators in the McMahon and for our lab at other institutions, as well as the NIH for their nice funding. Are there any questions? Thank you. We have about two minutes for questions.
Well, um, if there are no questions, um, we can go ahead and move on to the final speaker of the session, who is um, Harvey Lee, who I think is here. Let's see. Um, hmm. Oh, here, here we go. Okay, who will be speaking today on biosynthesis of an activatable fluorescent MRA contrast agent. Hi, uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, so today I'll be presenting our new biosynthetic activatable MRA contrast agent uh, developed here at the GLAD lab of Michigan State University. Um, before I begin, I'd like to provide some background as of how we started this project, which was focused on harnessing the unique properties of bare earth elements. Um, despite their name, they can be quite abundant throughout the earth's crust, although they're typically spread out in low concentrations to be mined in a cost-effective manner. Um, as we can see in this pie chart, uh, these elements are used in almost every sector of industry for a myriad of applications um, that are essential to modern technology. Uh, naturally, this includes natural national defense, where they can be used in tanks, uh, guided missiles, high-powered lasers, night vision goggles, and even the monitors we're looking at right now. Um, in nature, there exists a species of bacteria that has the potential to gather these resources from the environment. Our lab and collaborators have utilized engineering and evolution to create a new species of methylotrophic bacteria that can gather these resources from the environment in a more efficient manner. Um, upon the deletion of a certain gene, this strain of bacteria um, boasts rare earth element reliant growth, exemplified through gadolinium and lanthanum here, and it has been biologically evolved to develop an increased storage capacity um, for the heavier lanthanides such as gadolinium. Um, at the top, we have the growth curves of our evolved strain as a triangle, and um, the wild type strain is squares. And then gadolinium is depicted in pink, and whereas lanthanum is in blue. And although not as fast as the lanthanum curves, we can see that only the evolved strain possesses robust growth with gadolinium, whereas the wild type um, takes a long time, um, or rather does not. Um, on the top center is the absorbent spectra of gadolinium and lanthanum fed cells. We can actually see this on the, on the right um, in that pink. Uh, in that pink hue over there. Um, the bottom left is ICP MS data showing that the evolved strain possesses a 40 fold increase um, in storage of gadolinium, which amounts to several milligrams, um, se several milligrams of per gram of dry cell weight, which is interesting because it suggests that gadolinium, more gadolinium is required to fulfill its role in the cell's metabolic process when compared to lanthanum. Here in the bottom center, uh, we have MRI data that clearly distinguish the gadolinium fed cells from the rest of the controls here in blue, um, along with the colorful T1 maps on the top, um, these are which, are which is the blue stuff that I talked about earlier, um, where each pixel indicates its corresponding T1 relaxation time as absolute values. Um, so a common denominator from these strains of bacteria, both from nature and from our lab, is the expression of a rare earth element binding protein. We've taken certain portions of the DNA sequence that encodes to this protein, and we've cloned it into a larger sequence that transcribes and then ultimately translates into an interesting protein um, that has been engineered to fluoresce upon binding rare earth elements. Um, so after optimizing the codons for which the host cell prefers, um, which was E. coli, uh, we cloned the DNA into a circular vector and transformed them into the E. coli cells, which were designed uh, specifically for high protein expression. Um, after growth under optimal conditions, uh, these cells were then lysed to attain cell abstract um, and then were loaded into a column with, with fluid with resin, which um, was affinity-based column for purification. Uh, the resin inside these columns, they bind a certain tag on our protein on the C-terminus for this particular reason. Um, after it's washed out, um, we can finally elute the protein from the column. So as we can see on the right, uh, we have a Western blot confirming uh, the purification of our protein, whereas lane one represents the cellular extract and lane two represents the purified protein. Um, this protein was termed glamour um, and it undergoes conformational change upon binding rare earths. So this cuts off the water, water pathway that protonates the chromophore, 
uh, switching the fluorescence from an off state to an on state, or the excitation with an optical light source with a wavelength of 488 nanometers is absorbed by the glimmer and it can be converted into an emission wavelength of green at 510 nanometers. Um, as you can see um, in the data on the bottom right, the first generation of glamour succeeded in giving off a 23% delta F over F naught, uh, whereas our second generation design had enhanced the jump um, approximately fivefold um, up to 116%. So depending on protein purity and other parameters, we've achieved numbers low as 70%, high as 500%. Um, so far, we've tested the glamour with three different rare earth elements, which seem to induce the same amount of light, whereas non-rare earths such as calcium do not seem to trigger a response. Uh, the reaction time seems to be instantaneous as the rare earth elements were injected right after the second read over here, um, after the second read point. So where each read point is uh, an average of 10 separate reads with five different wells containing our protein. Um, and upon binding gadolinium, one of the rare earths, the, get, the glamour can be used as a fluorescent MRI contrast agent. Um, gadolinium generates this contrast due to seven uh, unpaired electrons in the S ground state that generate a long uh, electronic relaxation time and large magnetic moment. Um, in successful gadolinium-based contrast agents, the gadolinium ion is bound to eight coordinating I, uh, atoms of the chelate and the ninth position in, re, interacts with rapidly exchanging water molecules. Uh, the gadolinium shortens the water molecules T1 relaxation time. And due to fast exchange of the water molecule with the bulk water, it shortens the average T1. Uh, so after several steps of washing and confirming the lack of unbound gadolinium in solution, we imaged the protein gadolinium complex solution with a seven Tesla MRI. And it was obvious the sample had shortened the T1 relaxation time more than enough uh, to distinguish itself from the control groups as shown in the T1 maps provided here. Um, and as a measure of the MRI contrast agent potency, we plotted the differences in the relaxation rates um, as a function of gadolinium concentration to derive the relaxivity. Um, although the calculated relaxivity um, can differ depending on the parameters that are tested, most commercial contrast agents, um, they fall uh, within three to five, as, as we can see here on this chart, whereas the glamour shows a relaxivity of six. Uh, What's more is that the glamour, since it's a protein, can be freeze dried into a powder form um, and reconstituted with just water. Um, and it's been tested with along this um, relaxivity plot, um, suggesting its compatibility with major conditions for storage and transportation. Um, as biological therapeutics are on the rise, it's anticipated that we'll be able to witness this with contrast agents as well uh, for diagnosis uh, through molecular imaging. Um, to sum, uh, we, we've shown that the biosynthetic contrast agents such as the Glamour uh, can be just as effective or maybe even better than products synthesized through several steps of chemical reactions. Um, biosynthesis offers an easy, simple production process that would have otherwise been uh, required several steps of chemical reactions and um, expensive to manufacture. Um, an example of this technology can be found in insulin, which is produced at, extreme, at very low prices um, by pharmaceutical companies such as Eli Lilly with bacterial cultures that have been engineered for the expression of humanized recombinant insulin. Um, similarly, in other areas, industry can Industry utilizes biosynthesis to create organic compounds such as fuel production in the energy industry. Um, it is therefore expected that the mass production of Glamour could be fairly simple as any of these production lines may be piggybacked and also because logistics could not have, would not have requirements such as transportation in minus 80 degrees uh, freezer trucks like the Pfizer vaccine for COVID-19. Um, Major advancements were made in the world of molecular imaging for the past two decades. Despite these advancements, uh, reporter genes were only able to demonstrate large targets such as tumors or viral infections. Uh, nevertheless, with substantial influence from synthetic biology such as reduction of costs in DNA synthesis and sequencing, uh, the development of new molecular tools are producing more sensitive and multifunctional genetically encoded reporters. And uh, through this study, it's hoped that the Glamour will help in expanding the growing toolbox of 
genetically encoded reporters that can observe uh, biological phenomena on the molecular level and for a more precise and personalized diagnosis and therapy. Uh, thank you. And with that, I guess I'll take any questions. Yeah, we have uh, at least three minutes for questions um, with a couple minutes left for um, additional comments. I guess I have a question, I'll go first. Uh, this is, what sounds like a really exciting and promising technology. I wonder um, how long it usually takes for this kind of new technology to, um, for imaging to go through an an approval process so that it, it actually can be used. Um, can you comment on that sort of timeline for? Um, well, as it is with therapeutics, usually FDA approval for therapeutics, they require 10 to 15 years, um, which has been the norm. But uh, recently, as we've seen with the COVID pandemic, <laughs> um, it's obvious that somewhere along that pipeline, things can be rushed. Um, of course, since we were in a particular uh, unique position here during this pandemic. I assume that um, there was a special uh, reason as of why we rushed uh, the approval of these vaccines. But normally, um, it takes 10 to 15 years. Of course, if this um, type of therapeutic or diagnostic um, or imaging agent has been is based off of something that's previously been approved by the FDA, um, it has been known to be shorter. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of people here who know more than I do on this topic. Um, but depending on what the design is, has it been used before, um, and the, the, the level of how much it's been developed, I assume it could be faster, it could be slower, but usually it takes a very long time for this, something new to be clinically approved. Great, thank you. Any other questions? So um, we have about three minutes according to my clock. So I just wanna just open up the floor for questions to any of the speakers since we have a few minutes left of the session. Um, I, I'll just ask one question, I'll ask, I'll ask a question. Um, Chris, you seem to have gotten a lot of comments. Do you wanna just say anything more about some of the comments you received? We have, we have, we have two minutes, so I don't know if you wanna jump in. I was, yeah, I think it's an interesting discussion about um, phage and, and uh, the pressure on bacteria. And I think it's the Wolbachia discussion is pretty interesting, something I wanna look more into. Um, but I mean, that is like a big area in microbiology right now is discovery of all of these phage defense systems. And many of them are on uh, horizontally transferred genomic DNA, like we saw for cholera. So, you know, it's, I think it's pretty interesting that bacteria have all these different redundant systems and we're just now starting to appreciate those mechanisms. So I think it, it really um, supports what everybody was saying about how important phage are in driving the evolution of bacteria. And it's also going to be important too in thinking about using phage, uh, phage therapy, like what Paul's lab is doing. So we'll have to take into account these defense mechanisms. And the other part that we, we sort of talked about in that conversation was the trade-offs between all the other things that are going on in the organism's environment, which 
may or may not make phage therapy more um, deployable. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, these systems that we've discovered, they, they really seem to be shut off pretty tightly. And so it's not like they're sort of active. They're like off and then something triggers on them and they become active. So, you know, they have to keep these systems really shut down. And of All course, right. would, yeah. Oh, go ahead, Joe. Go ahead. No, I was going to say that would indicate that they're costly and, sure. and therefore would be, as you know, Paul's experiments showed good targets. Um, you know, we, we, we're presenting a paper in one of the upcoming sessions where we were doing selection for excess iron resistance and phage resistance simultaneously. And in, in our case, we didn't find any, any trade offs. We thought we would, but we didn't. Great. Looking forward to that. Okay, I just want to uh, thank all the seminar speakers um, for a great session and hope we get a chance to follow up with each other uh, in, in our discussion. So thanks again, everyone, for participation. Thanks, everyone. Y'all.